so I think we'll just try to do it with uh, with the bell. So I'm Sam Scarpino. I did my PhD here actually in ecology, evolution, behavior, uh, but I'm now an assistant professor in the mathematics and statistics department at the University of Vermont. And I'm going to talk today about uh, an ongoing collaborative project that I have uh, with Dave DeMarais, Rafael Guerrero, and Jesse Lasky. And essentially where the project starts is this observation I think we've all had that in biological systems, it's never the case that individual genes, like these dots here, or if these dots were populations, individual populations, or if these were actually individuals, that they interact in isolation from other people, other genes, other populations. So we know that there is some pattern of connectivity that unites, say, individuals in a social network, or unites genes in some gene interaction network, or unites populations in a metapopulation structure. And we know that these constraints can be very important for how a population might respond to changing selection pressures, how uh, an individual might interact with their neighbors, how genes might interact to form uh, complex phenotypes. But one of the exciting things when these nodes here are genes is that there's variation between individuals in the structure of these gene interaction networks. And there's variation among populations in the prevalence of these different types of gene interaction networks, which means, because these are also heritable, that the types of selection pressures that we're interested in can affect the shape of these gene interaction networks. And that tells us two things. One, that we probably need to account for variability in gene interaction networks when we're thinking about selection, how selection is going to change phenotypes, change populations. But this might also give us a lens into what types of selection pressures are acting in different populations uh, or for different traits. So I just have a cartoon here. This is the same network we had before. And we might imagine that there's three populations. And in the orange population, you want to activate this red gene, which then turns on these three blue genes. But you don't want to turn on these four genes over here on the side. And so if there was some mutation that, say, broke this connection here, that might be advantageous. Whereas in these three populations, maybe there's more of a gradient. And so as you move increasingly through these darker blue populations, you just want more and more and more of all of these products. So you turn on the red gene, and then maybe you slowly ramp up uh, the, the production of whatever the red gene is coding for that then turns on uh, all of these other genes. And you can think about this as being variation in space or also variation in the dimensionality of the phenotype. Right. So it may be the case that. This, these phenotypes here are much more modular, whereas this is a much more organizational phenotype that's interacting with lots of different uh, aspects of the individual. So to try to push on these ideas a little bit, we're going to use uh, two data sets from Arabidopsis. And the first data set, uh, they did a dry down experiment with 18 uh, genotypes of Arabidopsis. So they just put them uh, in soil, and then they stop watering them very slowly. They extract. Uh, RNA that they hybridize to microarrays to get a measure of gene expression. And then from this experiment, they end up with a whole bunch of expression profiles representing about 22,000 phenotypes, uh, or a large portion of the genes in the Arabidopsis genome. And a similar experiment done with cold acclimation. So for cold acclimation, as I'm sure many of you know, if you just stick an Arabidopsis in the freezer, it will almost certainly die. But if you put it in the fridge for a little while first and then stick it in the freezer, a lot of them will actually survive. And so we'll have this. Cold acclimation with slightly fewer genotypes, again, hybridizing to a microarray with a bunch of different phenotypes. And what they saw was what a lot of you might expect. So on the left here, these are the results from the soil drying. On the right, these are the cold acclimation results. Each line is a different accession or genotype. We see lots of genes that show some environmental effect. When you put them in the dry environment versus the wet environment, maybe the expression pattern goes up. Uh, similarly, in unacclimated versus acclimated. But what we're interested in here are these genes that show some gene by environment interaction for expression. So we have the same plots here, wet versus dry, unacclimated versus acclimated. The lines are genotypes. And you see here how these lines are all crossing each other, right? Telling you that there's some gene by environment interaction in expression. And so these genes here are genes that are, we think are punitively involved in local adaptation, right? These are the types of genes that may be important for explaining differences between populations in their response to drought. <laughs> We took a network from a paper by Feltis et al. in 2013 where they have 7,100 microarrays. And from those 7,100 microarrays, they construct a gene expression network for Arabidopsis. So we basically imagine a big matrix with 25,000 rows and 25,000 columns. And the entry in the matrix are the correlation between the expression patterns of these different genes. All right, and this is going to be our measure for what this interaction network looks like in these populations. We're going to take our 
10,000 G by E, 1,000 G by E genes for drought and 2,100 G by E genes for cold and map them on to this co-expression network. So what we're going to end up with is maybe some genes that didn't show any G by E effect in either treatment case, some genes maybe in purple that showed only a response in the cold case, and then some genes that showed a response in the drought case. And what we're going to ask is whether these genes differ in terms of how they're sitting in the network. Right? So do they fall randomly in this gene interaction network? Are the cold genes just picking genes at random with respect to where they're sitting in these gene interaction networks? Are the drought genes doing that? And if they're not, are they doing it non-randomly in the same way? Are all the drought genes you know, sitting in very tight modules? Are they much more spread out throughout the genome? Does that look like uh, the pattern that we see for the cold genes? And we have reason to believe, at least in flowering plants, that we're going to see a striking difference between the cold and the drought genes. So the cold response in flowering plants is, for the most part, evolutionarily conserved. There's a tightly regulated module of genes that seems to be present in lots of different plant species that all are responding to cold, in particular cold acclimation. And for drought, it seems to be much more idiosyncratic. And that either could be because you have lots of repeated evolution of drought tolerance, or drought is touching on a much more diverse set of phenotypes, whereas cold maybe is just a single phenotype uh, that, that is much more uh, united, or you have maybe a climb of increasing cold temperature that a population, that a, that a group of plants are maybe falling on. And so the first thing that we see is that these genes are, are not randomly distributed throughout the genome. So what we're going to do, so this expression network is not one fully connected graph. There are lots of little subgraphs of genes that are all connected to each other and not connected to other genes. So we're going to use a statistical technique to identify these sets of genes that are more tightly connected to each other than to other sets of genes. So we end up with about uh, 80 or so of these communities, which are just sets of genes, as I said, that are connected to each other and loosely connected to other places. This is the community size. And this is the fraction of these E, G by E genes that are sitting in the community for dry genes. And what you can see is that most of the dry genes are sitting in these relatively small communities. They're spread out from each other uh, and sitting in these very tiny communities that are very tightly connected to each other and very, very loosely connected to, to other, individual, uh, other individual communities. And we see the opposite for cold genes. So 50% of the cold genes are sitting in these two giant communities. So they're not randomly distributed throughout the genome, and they're sitting in different types of communities with respect to the community size. If we just look at two of the communities, and these are a little bit hard to see, these are two communities that have lots of cold genes or lots of dry genes. The colors here are genes that show G by E. The gray are the ones that don't. The lines that you can't see are what connect them. And if you just sort of squint at it a little bit, you maybe can convince yourself that all these blue dots are in the middle of this blob and all of the red dots are spread out on the periphery. Right? So we can use network metrics to try to ask whether this is actually true. So the first thing we can look at is just the degree. So the number of connections this is going to be weighted by the, the correlations in the expression data, with the number of connections that each gene has. These are the EG by E genes for drought. These are the rest of the genome. And we see, this is a log scale here, we see that the EG by E genes for drought have much lower degree, on average about four connections to other genes uh, than the rest of the genome. We get this p-value by just randomizing which genes we call, uh, e.g. by e genes for drought. We do this 10,000 times to get a distribution over the difference of these two genes. And that distribution becomes our distribution for uh, evaluating uh, whether this is significant. We also, so we did this randomization or this permutation over the whole gene network. We also did it within each individual community because you might imagine that certain modules have to be involved in the drought response. And so the relevant distribution that we want to create is over those modules that are involved, we get the same, the same p-value. And then we can look at another measure of just raw centrality. Again, this is the EG by E genes, the non-EG by E genes, a measure called the eigenvector centrality, which is similar to Google's PageRank algorithm. And basically, it has something to do with how many shortest paths go through me, but it also matters how many shortest paths go through genes connected to me, right? So you might be interested in my research, but we know Dave does great science, and so the fact that Dave and I are working together, that bumps up my profile and people who don't know me as well, right? <laughs> For cold genes, we see that cold genes have significantly higher degree, degree of almost 50 compared to 4, so almost a factor of 10 higher. And we see that they're much more central. So what we're seeing here is that for drought adaptation, it looks much more like this case. The genes are very peripheral. They're sitting out on the edges of these gene interaction networks, telling us 
that either we're looking at a much more disjoint set of phenotypes or we're looking at a much more spatially heterogeneous pattern of drought that these plants are experiencing. And for cold, we see the opposite, that either it's this clinal pattern or really it is this sort of tightly regulated set of phenotypes or single phenotype that's just being dialed up or down uh, with respect to the cold, uh, the cold response. So this leads us to where we want to go next, which is to try to evaluate these hypotheses uh, a little bit further. So we're going to redo this experiment in a different plant species, because if it is the case that it's this uh, evolutionarily conserved phenotype with respect to cold response, we should see the same type of pattern with respect to the gene expression networks if we do this in another species. We also, uh, this gene here is probably not going to show a G by E effect. It's going to be these, maybe these downstream genes. So you might imagine that this gene here is the one that actually has genetic variation that differs between, say, cold acclimated populations and populations that don't experience cold. And so these here, I mean, they're important for local adaptation, maybe, but these aren't the actual players with respect to the genes that are driving the change. It's this individual here. So what we can do is just identify these E, G by E genes and then walk upstream in the network and find the genes that have significant FST values between populations. And then Dave can take them into the lab and actually evaluate whether uh, we can manipulate the genome of these individuals and get differences with respect to drought or cold tolerance. And then finally, we'd like to go into natural populations and actually try to assess how much variability there is in these gene expression networks between different populations, say, of Arabidopsis, and whether if we were to do things like reciprocal transplant experiments, we would get the types of response we would expect given uh, the variation in, in these gene co-expression networks. But one of the fascinating things seems to be that this sort of average network from the Feltis study is really telling us something that's biologically relevant, despite the fact that it seems like it shouldn't because it's coming from this amalgamation of a bunch of different studies. The last thing I want to do is just plug our new complex systems and data science master's program at the University of Vermont. So if you're interested in something like that, I'd be thrilled uh, to talk to you about it. And again, just acknowledging Dave, Jesse, Raphael, and then funding uh, from the Santa Fe Institute primarily. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions.